Sean Kelly Reviews, Late Night with the Devil, with special guest Jolie Feverstone. Like and subscribe for more content like this. Late Night with the Devil is written and directed by Cameron and Colin Cairns, and stars David Desmelchin, Laura Gordon, Ian Bliss, Faisal Bazzi, Ingrid Torelli, Reese Otteri, and Georgina Haig. A Halloween night episode of a late night talk show goes horribly wrong in Late Night with the Devil. Night Owls of Jack Leroy was a once thriving 1970s late night talk show which began tanking in the ratings following Deroy's wife Madeline's death from cancer. Hoping to make a mark during Sweeps Week, Jack hosts a special episode on Halloween night of 1977 with guests including psychic medium Chris Dew and magician turned skeptic Carmichael Hunt. The highlight of the episode is parapsychologist June Ross Mitchell and her patient Lily Diabo, the sole survivor of a satanic cult who seemingly harbors a demonic entity. Late Night of the Devil is a found footage horror film written and directed by Cameron and Colin Cairns. Following a brief prologue narrated by Michael Ironside, detailing the history of Jack Delroy's talk show, the remainder of the film consists of the Halloween episode of Night Owls in its entirety, complete with black and white behind the scenes B-roll during the commercial breaks. At the core of this episode is Lily, a satanic cult survivor who claims to have an entity named Mr. Riggles inside of her. When Jack decides he wants to communicate with this entity, he ends up getting much more than he bargained for. And now we shall continue the review of our guest, Jolie Feverstone. Jolie Feverstone is the editor of Toronto Film Files and also contributed to Wiley Wrights and Filmotomy. Um, she's also a semi-regular guest on the uh, Matt Cast. And um, the reason I invited her is we were both in Montreal last July to see the Canadian premiere screening of Late Night of the Devil at the uh, Fantasia Film Festival, where it won the uh, Silver Audience Award for Best International Feature. And uh, previously, Late Night of the Devil had its uh, world premiere at the 2023 South by Southwest Film Festival. And it also played at the uh, 2023 Toronto After Dark Film Festival, where it won the Gold Audience Award for Best Feature Film, along with the awards for Best Editing. Best lead performance, best screenplay, and most original film. So, um, what are you, your uh, thoughts on uh, Late Night with the Devil? Yeah, well, first off, thank you for inviting me. And I really enjoyed um, being able to see you at Fantasia and to see this film. Um, it was one of the films I was really excited about at the Fantasia Film Festival. Um, and I truly, truly uh, ended up enjoying it. Um, I really loved the kind of setting, you know, being set back in the 70s on this late night talk show and really kind of tapping into that kind of um, era where people were really interested or starting to become really interested in um, the occult and mysticism. Um, but then you soon after have the reactive side of things with the whole uh, satanic panic that starts coming up in the 80s. So I thought it was just a really cleverly set film in terms of their choice and time. Um, and of course, the performances are fantastic. It, it was just so engaging. I, I truly was like on the edge of my seat the whole time. Well, I guess we'll start with the performances because um, the film stars uh, David Desmelchin, who is... Um, one of those that guy actors who's pretty much in everything. Um, uh, I think most people probably know him f from the Suicide Squad. And, um, I think he's also in the Ant-Man films. And, um, but like he's, he's like in everything. He's like, uh, I'm looking at these, I'm the, now he's in Oppenheimer. He's in the Boogeyman. He's in Flash TV series. He's, <laughs> he has a large filmography, but I think this is his first like real lead role. Yeah, you're. I, I love how you put it. He's sort of that that guy actor. He's his uh, filmography is quite prolific. He's been in dozens and dozens of films, both um, indie and genre films, but also big budget uh, blockbuster films, like you mentioned, Suicide Squad, um, and now of course Oppenheimer. Um, and it's it's quite interesting. He has um, this certain sort of. Uh, gravitas to him that even when he is playing roles that are uh you know 
not that don't have a ton of screen time. For example, his role in uh, Dune Chapter One, um, he still has this presence about him that kind of makes you remember him. So whenever he pops up in all these films, you see him and you're like, "Oh, him! He's great!" You know. <laughs> um, but it was really, really. Um, it was really cool to see him get to play um, the leading man role. Um, and it's sort of like a leading man role within uh, like a film within a film, so to speak, um, because he truly is uh, within like the, the, the world of the film. He is this sort of very celebrated, um, so uh, like l- l- celebrated kind of figure in uh, in pop culture so it was really interesting to see him play that role and it's a very i felt it was like a very american role um as this um really beloved sort of clean cut talk show host um so being able to see him play that after we tend to see him or at least in the films that i've seen of his he tends to play kind of troubled characters or very quirky kind of eccentric characters so seeing him play this kind of uh, America's sweetheart role was very, very interesting. Okay, so, so um, what do you think of the uh, films? Like, it's not quite a found footage film, but it's like the format is like a single episode of a talk show. So, how do you think that was pulled off? Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, it it's it, it, I love the question because you kind of forget. I think at some points, or at least I found myself kind of forgetting I'm watching a found footage film. Um, and I thought it was really interesting how it started off um, almost like a documentary or like a, like a crime special, like a 2020 kind of special um, about this figure and this sort of um, infamous episode of TV. And then, of course, you watch this tape and the, the of course, the production value is top notch. The sets, the, the art design, the production design is just beautiful. You really do feel like you're um, very in that time period. Um, but I think it, over time, you kind of forget sometimes you're watching this found footage film, um, which is, is quite interesting. And uh, it's, I don't think that's hard to pull off, you know, uh, or sorry, I think that's hard to pull off. I think that's hard to get people kind of so lost in the film when you are making a film that's kind of um, within that found footage framework. So yeah, I give I give the team uh, behind the film a lot of kudos for that um, because they, they did execute it very well. Um, but how about you? Did you kind of feel... Uh, the whole time that you were watching a found footage film, or did you kind of, like me, get lost at some points? Well, I'm, I'm glad that uh, Late Night of the Devil is getting a limited theatrical release, because this is the way to see the film. Um, you can attest that um, Fantasia, they were pretty much playing along with the talk show, so we have, like, when the audience starts applauding, the audience at Fantasia started applauding, so... It was definitely an interactive experience. Uh, I'm so glad uh, as well that I saw this at Fantasia um, in a in a packed theater late at night too. If I remember correctly, it was quite it was a late a screening. It was a nine thirty screening. Yeah, so it it really felt like this after dark kind of uh, mood, and uh, like you mentioned, the crowd at Fantasia is just fantastic. It's a very um, engaged audience and it's an audience that truly does love film they're not you know they're not just there to say they were there they're there because they're genuinely interested in in the film and kind of having this collective experience so i'm really glad i saw it there and i do hope people um get a chance to see it on the big screen because seeing it in a darkened room especially late at night is is a really special experience yeah i think it was like uh, confirmed today that i think cineplex here in canada is doing some sort of release um I looked today and the only showtimes I saw were in Guelph. So hopefully it gets some Toronto <laughs> dates. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, I hope it comes to Toronto or I hope it at least comes to more parts of Ontario because uh, it really is a great mm-hmm. film for like a late night screening. So I guess we'll maybe talk about some of the other cast members. So um, so we have pretty much who I call the human antagonist of the film, uh, Carmichael Hunt, uh, played by um, Ian Bliss. So I don't, I don't know if you would recognize him with like the gray beard, but... He's probably best known for being in the Matrix Reloaded as uh, Bane, the uh, crew member who pretty much becomes the human avatar for Agent Smith. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. It, it was hard. I, I didn't recognize him at first, and I think yeah. I, I went on the IMDb and I was like, oh, wow, that's him. <laughs> Carmichael Hunt is 
sort of based on a real person, which would be a Canadian, um, uh, James Randi, who is best known as a magician who later in life uh, spent his time debunking psychics. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's so cool. Um, I actually didn't even uh, know until recently that James Ernie was Canadian, which I, I think is is mm -hmm. super, super cool and interesting. Um, but yeah, I thought his character was very, uh, well, first of all, his performance was uh, fantastic. He really, um, uh, I love how you call him the, the human antagonist of the film, because he truly is, um, like in every sense of the word, sort of an agitator on that stage. And he's truly, um, you know, always kind of agitating, um, the cast members kind of, but in service in a way, or at least in his mind, he's acting in service of the audience to kind of show them that this is some sort of hoax or a trick. Um, and, uh, I, what I thought was really interesting when I started to read a bit more, about uh james randy was that apparently there was uh, a couple instances where people he was literally demonstrating how he did a trick um and how that trick is kind of used by uh, folks who say that they're uh, psychics or things like that and in on two instances people actually said he was lying about um the fact that he uh was doing a trick they actually believed that he had psychic powers and he was using them to his advantage and lying telling people he's just doing these tricks which i thought was a really interesting um kind of really interesting ironic thing and i i really found in the film that it was interesting because um at I think in so many other films, we might have seen um, Carmichael sort of get like redeemed or vindicated a little bit, but throughout the film, yeah, he really, he, he really uh, does kind of become almost like, no, I don't want to say a villain, but he does uh, start to really, I think, put, put his foot in his mouth. <laughs> Van Vers is kind of like a opponent, the uh, psychic Christu, who we're, we'll get to a bit of a spoiler discussion later, but like Christu is pretty much the typical psychic who like ask questions of the audience and then come out with like very basic facts and then that would either amaze or in, in the case of Carmichael, annoy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that that's such a good way to put it, that the two are kind of... Um, very interesting they're kind of i feel like they have the same motivation but from two opposite sides of the coin they both have a motivation to kind of serve uh, the audience uh chris do i think truly does um you know believe that he is doing something in service in bringing comfort and healing to people in the audience um Whereas Carmichael sort of like, I'm serving the audience by showing them that this is a hoax <laughs> and th these people are kind of preying upon their emotions. So it's very interesting because they kind of uh, have the same motivation, but two, two different sides of the coin. Uh, but then there is the main guest of the show, which is um, Dr. June Ross Mitchell, played by Laura Gordon, and her uh, ward, Lily Diabo, played by played excellently by Ingrid Torelli. And um, as the background is that um, Lily is the survivor of a satanic death cult. And she uh, brought something with her by the name of Mr. Riggles. <laughs> Which is an excellent name. <laughs> That's amazing. Yes. Oh, I, I really... Um... Uh, they both delivered great performances, um, but um, the performance as Lily, I thought, was truly e exceptional. Um, it's uh, yeah, I don't, I don't want to dive in into spoilers per se, um, but we could maybe get into that later. Um, but mm. yeah, the portrayal of Lily was very, very well done. Um, very reminiscent, I, I would say, of classic horror films as well, like The Exorcist um, and things kind of of that era, the 1970s uh, horror era. Um, yeah, excellent performance, for sure. And perhaps uh, not so coincidentally, or maybe coincidentally, because there's a, <laughs> a documentary about it just last year, um, Lily Diablo story is very, very, very similar to that of Michelle Smith, 
who kickstarted the satanic panic when her psychiatrist helped her write a book called Michelle Remembers. Yes, I'm so glad that you brought that up because I um, saw the documentary uh, called Satanic Panic, which is based off uh, Satan Michelle wants you. Smith. Satan wants you. Oh, sorry. Yes, Satan, uh, <laughs> Satan wants you. Sorry. Yes, I'm getting all my titles confused. Thank you. Yes, Satan <laughs> wants you. Uh, the documentary about Michelle Smith and, of course, the creation of that book, Michelle Remembers. Um, I, I also saw that at Fantasia, the same festival in which we saw Late Night uh, with the Devil. And, oh, I absolutely uh, enjoyed that documentary. Um, it's Canadian made. Um, and also, I, and I didn't know this until I it's saw the Canadian documentary. Story. That, yeah, it's a Canadian story. I didn't know that until I saw the documentary that Michelle Smith herself was Canadian. Um, and in fact, one of the co-directors mentioned that he grew up in her neighborhood and it was very much a thing in their neighborhood. Um, people knew her or at least knew of her. And it was something kind of like an, yeah, just a, a neighborhood thing that everyone knew. Um, and it's such an interesting documentary. And I, I really love that you um, uh, found these parallels between uh, Lily Diabo and Michelle Smith, because I, it, it is very interesting, especially like the um, the connection with um, someone who is kind of supposed to be in their care. <laughs> you know, um, uh, you know, there's always like someone that's uh, a caregiver or uh, a therapist of some in, uh, of some um, position of that sort with them, um, and to see that reflected in the Lily Diablo character was really interesting. And I, I feel that like the films um, would make a great double feature. <laughs> And they actually played close together at Fantasia. Hmm. Yeah, I think I saw them like, if, yeah, I saw them uh, very close together at the festival, which was, mm -hmm. it was great. I kind of had a theme going for the mm -hmm. festival. Yeah, well, it's going to be hard to talk any further without spoilers, so spoiler warning. Well, I guess um, we'll probably... Probably as a like a preamble to the spoilers, we we'll have to talk about um, Georgina Haig as um, Madeline Delroy, who is the uh, late wife of uh, David Desmouchin's character, and um, she's really only in the film during like the, the preamble documentary, but then she reappears. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it's very interesting because, um, yeah, we see her, it, she kind of bookends the film uh, in a way. Um, and yeah, seeing her story kind of play out and as things get revealed towards the end of the film and in the final sequence, um, you kind of realize there's been sort of almost like a breadcrumb trail uh, of her and her story coming to light throughout the film. Um, it's, you know what, I actually haven't seen the film since Fantasia, but now I, um, I really want to see it again because I think it'll be a great film to watch a second time um, and kind of pick up a little bit more of those breadcrumbs along the way. Pretty much a quick summary of what the big reveal is. So it is... Kind of, it is established in the like opening documentary that Jack Delroy was a member of this uh, group in the woods called The Grove. And it turns out that The Grove is actually related to the satanic cult that Lily was part of. And that to get his uh, ratings that Jack Delroy pretty much sold his soul. But in exchange, his wife died of cancer. Yeah, it's quite a, it's quite an intense moment, I think, when that all comes to light. Um, and yeah, it's, it's very interesting because certainly at the beginning of the film, um, Jack Delroy is portrayed with a very, I want to say, kind of very sympathetic light. And he's kind of this um, upstanding American citizen. And, uh, you know, he loves his wife and, you know, just like an all around kind of like good uh, celebrity role model. Um, and then as this is revealed, it really does kind of make you start to question everything um, in the sense that, yeah, he, he really did kind of make a deal with the devil, so to speak. And uh, 
uh, in a way sort of they kind of allude to the fact that you know he's he sort of knew that he'd have to give something away uh, to make this deal with the devil to to achieve the success that he's had and unfortunately um that involved the the illness and eventual um death of his wife so yeah it really kind of turns this notion of him being this very upstanding kind of american role model on its head yeah and then then, like his insistence to like have lily bring bring mr riggos out Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah no it's it's so uh, those to me were my favorite scenes when we actually see or well when we actually start interacting with mr riggles and there's this very palpable tension on uh, jack's part um and we definitely start to get the sense that maybe this is not the first time that he's had some interactions with uh, you know a demonic figure so yeah i i really really love those scenes and i thought um das Malshin, uh did such a great job because you really do feel like in this moment you kind of feel like you're on the stage with them as this is all unfolding we move on back to carmichael and his efforts to try and prove that this is all like mass hypnotism with a great moment involving uh jack Darroy's psychic gus oh my gosh yes that oh yeah there are certain scenes that are not for squeamish folks that's for sure <laughs> Even I think at one point, I'm not typically a squeamish person, but even I at one point was like, oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a lot. (laughs) It was so well done. But yeah, definitely not for uh, the squeamish. (laughs) But then um, we kind of like break it down to like the finale of the film when pretty much all hell goes loose. (laughs) Yes. Yes, literally, in a way. <laughs> well, for, start- for starters, we'll uh, talk more about um, Ingrid Torelli's performance as Lily is because if- even when Mr. Riggles is not in control, you can tell that something's not right with her. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, she does a great job. Um, l- like you mentioned, even the times when uh, Mr. Riggles is not kind of manifesting through her um you can just always see this kind of like inner turmoil um or like an inner tension within her which she um yeah she just relays so much through her body language um even through her eyes as well so you always kind of know there's something up there's something going on here um and you'd uh, you don't really know what's going to happen next. And then certainly when we meet Mr. Riggles um, <laughs> and then we start to kind of see Lily sort of slowly kind of um, unravel, even when he is not presently manifesting there, um, we start to see her unravel a bit. And um, it's unfortunate as well. You kind of feel a lot of um, sympathy for her because you kind of get the sense that there's uh, obviously certain characters that are not, have the, don't have her best interest at heart and are sort of kind of exploiting um, this aspect of her uh, for their own you know motivations despite the fact that clearly it takes a toll on her um, so yeah it, I actually had a lot of sympathy for her character but uh, the performance very very well done and the, the big reveal when Lily insists that they go back and watch the tape one of the big jump scares they reveal that Madeline's ghost is on the tape that was really cool I just yeah I, I loved how they did that and like you play back the tape the reveals like it's so yeah I, I think they did a great job of kind of playing with tension and kind of uh, playing with the uh, like what they chose to withhold and what they chose to present um yeah it was it was very very well written in that way and then there's just a full demonic shitstorm <laughs> when you know, just just you know, just it's like amazing how quickly things like go like they ha- you have like lily's head split into two and like you have carmichael finally believe and hand the check over to lily and then He's killed off. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah, and killed off is putting it, putting it very politely. <laughs> yes. Oh gosh, yeah, the final um, kind of like destruction is really, yeah, it 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 is truly this like hellish kind of implosion of everything, and um, you know everything just starts falling apart. Um, and you know what's really interesting? Um, it kind of made me think back to like the found footage. Uh, 
question as well, is that I feel that there's something so, again, like so interesting in how it's um, the film is actually structured like a found footage of like this lost tape where we literally see like the forces of hell like appear and manifest um, in this absolute chaotic destruction on American TV. Um, what I, I, I find it's interesting because even though it's set in the 70s, um, there's something kind of topical about it. You know, I think it, it gave me or it made me think a lot of like, like viral videos or like creepy pasta and kind of like urban legends that we see, you know, when it's like, oh, hey, have you seen the clip of, you know, insert urban legend or myth here. Um, and the film did just such a great job of kind of capturing that, like that tension and that kind of desire to see what happens. And, and it's like the, that kind of analogy of, of a train wreck. Like you don't want to see it because it's so destructive and it's evil and this and that, but you kind of can't look away. And I feel like that's kind of, they did a great job of kind of capturing that uneasy feeling at the end. Like you're literally witnessing all out chaos and destruction. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is not going to be a happy ending for anyone, which is not good, but I just can't look away because it's so fascinating. No, it actually would have been a good ending right there because like it goes to the screen technical difficulties. But then the film continues and kind of turns into like a surreal flashback revealing Jack Delroy's deal with the devil, pretty much. Yes, yes. I really, I like that part a lot, yeah. Then it goes to like the ending of the film where it, where somehow... Jack DeRoy is manipulated into killing Lily. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. And um, I wanted to ask you because I I really loved the the sequ this kind of sequence of the film when it's it's almost very like hallucinogenic as all of these kind of past forces and shadows come up. Um, I was really interested in kind of seeing that and and how the film kind of um, shows almost these like shadows of his past and the deals that he made and how he's sort of being like almost like pushed forward in life by these kind of demonic forces or evil forces. I would have loved to have seen a bit more of that. And I would have really loved to have seen maybe a little bit more of like, you know, his time or maybe, you know, not. I'm never the type to be like, oh yeah, they should make a sequel of everything. But I actually feel like that if there was going to be a sequel of this film, I would be very interested in seeing um, a bit more of like the Grove and kind of like how he got kind of involved in that and got involved in making these deals with the devil and how that obviously, you know, kind of led to the fateful events of that night. But how how do you feel about well, that? Well, I, I, well, I was fascinated well, by there that. There are suggestions that this whole episode was a setup and you could actually see in, in this flashback that I think there's like the weird guy dressed as a mummy or something who was previously in the studio audience and that, that he like appears in the flashback and you could tell that some of those members are plants and like so when like hell, all hell breaks it loose you, you don't know how much of that is quote-unquote real and how much of it is just part of like the mass hypnosis <laughs> that is leading for jack to commit the sacrifice mm -hmm. yeah no you were, you raise a good point there's so I think I, I, I really like that about the film, that it doesn't always give us a straight answer. <laughs> it kind of plays um, with our emotions. It kind of plays with the history. It, um, it, 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 does, uh, it doesn't really give us uh, any cut and dry kind of uh, exposition, which is good. You know, it's in service to the, uh, to the tension and kind of the uncertainty of the film. I, I rate out of five stars, and I my rating for Late Night of the Devil is four and a half stars. Nice. That's yeah. It it definitely deserves it. I think I would I would probably. It's funny because I think after I initially saw it, I would give it a four stars. But I think it's a film that every time I watch it again, I'm going to appreciate it even more. Um, so I'm going to stick with a four star for now, but um, to be continued as I see it again <laughs> and, and pick up more. So I have a list of from related films. Um, we already mentioned Satan Wants You, but um, another film, which I think is um, quite 
uh, similar is um, Ghost Watch. Have you seen that? I haven't. No, I haven't seen that. The story of Ghost Watch is that it was a uh, Halloween special produced by the BBC in the early 90s. And uh, people tuned into it late, not seeing like the opening credits and stuff. And they believed that it was an actual report about a haunting. That's so cool. I, it would be cool to have been one of those initial viewers, you know, when you're caught up in the moment and thinking you're seeing a real, <laughs> real footage. That's really cool. Yeah, so I actually have it here. They released a special edition Blu-ray of it a couple years ago. Cool. Oh my god. I like the cover art. That's really cool. Uh, late Night with the Devil is uh, being uh, destroyed Distributed by IFC uh, Midnight uh, in select theaters beginning on March 22nd, and sometime in April it'll be uh, streaming on Shutter as well. And uh, that's all. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for having me on again. 